um, which I appreciate the engagement of this community so much. So welcome to another um, End the War episode from Code Pink um, to help bring us all out of the fog of war and into the sanity of peace. I'm your host, Jody Evans. It's been another devastating few days in the United States of America. Children and people of color murdered in Buffalo, Orange County, and now Texas. The violence of weapons, the deaths of innocent people, the wars come home to our communities. This was all as Biden and Congress voted 40, over $40 billion to Ukraine, uh, almost 20 billion of it to weapons, and over half of US taxpayer money is going to weapons in war, and yet we continue to be shocked by the violence in our streets and not see any connection to the valuing of weapons and murdering innocent children and people of color around the world and what happens in our streets. Um, or as Kaylin Johnston said it last night, how militarism has created a profoundly sick empire that's held together by trauma and lies and poverty and inequality, mass scale psyops and war propaganda. So a few weeks ago, I read, I was shocked to read that um, Kagan had sold Washington the idea that we can win a nuclear war. So I reached out to our guest today, uh, Colonel Larry Wilkerson to help us think about this as we reached out to him at the beginning of the bombing of Ukraine so he could help us see through that fog. Um, and you can see that um, webinar um, to go back and to keep, you know, helping yourself be smarter in this fog. Lola put it in the chat. And I wanna thank Emily, Darrell and Lola for supporting on tech and the chat today. But um, the question was, uh, warmongering, has it now gone nuclear? But then at Davos this week, we were shocked to see that Biden is now on the right of war criminal Kissinger. And Biden's talking about military engagement in the Taiwan-China conversation as the State Department changes its website and takes down their agreement to a one China policy and creates out of thin air, a new policy without China at the table. So there's lots to talk about. My deepest gratitude for our guest, um, Colonel Wilkerson for joining us today. For those few of you here who um, might not know who he is, he's a professor at the College of William and Mary and a retired United States Army Colonel and the former Chief of Staff to United States Secretary of State Colin Powell, and a brilliant critical voice against US militarism. Thank you so much for joining us today, Larry. Thanks for having me, Jody, and to all your listeners. Thank you. So before we start with the question I reached out to you for, what do you think about Biden being to the right of Kissinger? Uh, well, I guess you saw that Henry's backed up a little bit, especially about Ukraine. <laughs> and, and well that he should, anyone who is as good a, a Mackinder person, uh, a heartland person, uh, a geopolitical thinker as Kissinger, even in his dotage, as it were, uh, knows that what we're doing is really dangerous, extremely dangerous. And the fact that we're doing it and the way we're doing it is reprehensible. We don't give a hang about Ukraine. We're using Ukraine and the conflict there to get to Russia. Ukraine is not a democracy. It's as far cry from a democracy as probably any other place on the face of the earth, especially those we've led into NATO, like Montenegro, who happens to have the distinction of being the leading country in the world in terms of automobile theft. So we've let some real characters into NATO, but uh, we didn't let Ukraine, thank goodness. It's not a democracy. It does have neo-Nazis in it. That is one thing Putin was right about. I have some Ukrainian friends who've told me about their being beaten to a pulp, literally, by these Nazis when they were in Ukraine. Uh, so we're using that essentially to try and destabilize Russia, to regime change in Moscow, to get rid of Putin, destabilize Russia. Why are we doing that? We're doing that to clear that flank so we can take China on. And that brings you to the statements that you were talking about earlier. And why are we going from strategic ambiguity with respect to Taiwan to strategic clarity, really strategic clarity. 
Um, I think there are a group of people inside the government, like Victoria Newland, like her husband outside the government, Kagan, and like other people, David Ignatius, Ignatius at the Washington Post. They're shills for the government in London, in Berlin, in Paris, in Moscow. The, the media are shills for the various governments. Um, they are not acting in the capacity they should be acting, challenging government policy and so forth. They are actually propagandists for the government, which is a real dangerous shift. They've been moving this way for some time, but ratings and so forth, bringing them that sort of uh, attitude. But now they're there. I mean, they are propagandists. I, I've followed this war in Ukraine, and, and one day the American media is lying through its teeth. Maybe it doesn't know it's lying through its teeth because it's so incompetent, so unprofessional, doesn't know what it's talking about. And then I look at the Russian media, such as it is and such as I can look at it, and I find the same thing, essentially. So you have warring medias in terms of the, the conflict also. This is not the way we're supposed to work, not the way a democracy is supposed to work. It's a very dangerous situation. And as you said, we've got nuclear weapons involved now, and we are minus almost any kind of formal arms control with regard to those weapons, other than New START, which I'm afraid may be in jeopardy from the way we're treating Putin now um, in Ukraine. So well, what arms control do we have left? On top right. of all of that, Modi in India has mounted a campaign and he's our ally, he's our ally. And he's mounted a campaign against the Muslims in India, the second largest Muslim population in the world, second only to Indonesia, um, that looks a lot like it might just, might just carry over into Pakistan, which of course is Pakistan because Muslims wanted a place to live in peace. Um, and that would be nuclear too, probably. So, and I've been there in 2002, we were as close to nuclear war between Pakistan and India as we've been since both became nuclear powers. It's a very dangerous situation we've set up in the world. And this cavalier attitude that some people in the military and elsewhere have toward nuclear weapons is the maximum danger. Well, let's, let's go to that because um, we know that's been talked about for a long time, but it rose to the surface of the media. Like now it's, you know, it's been, I want to say, infecting the brains of generals and the media and people in government for a while. But now the media is like, it's, it's raised its ugly head there. And, um, you know, in a normalization process, I feel like we're told, us, we're told these stories, they're rolled out in, in a way to normalize madness. Mm -hmm. And so here we have Victoria Newland's husband, Robert Kagan, arguing we can win a nuclear war. But then I start reading further and he's been doing this for a very long time. And I thought it a couple of years ago when I'm like, why is the US thinking of taking on China? That's a nuclear war. Do they really think they can win a nuclear war? It's, could that be, that, that's an absurd thought, right? But you know, now we're seeing that this is a strategy. And I mean, part of me wants to believe it's like part of their, uh, you know, their strategy positioning, but I, I don't believe that. I, I think they actually think they can win a nuclear war. And that thought um, frightens the hell out of me. And, and you, you've been there. So um, I, I'd love it if you could take us back to the fifties where you were saying that there was this mad idea and it got quashed and kind of how we've come back here. And then just like, why that's an insane idea given that, you know, <laughs> we make mistakes with drones and smart bombs, which aren't, which are dumb to exist in the first place. But, you know, mistakes like with those don't have lasting, you know, irreparable effects like a, a nuclear bomb. So. Well, for those, who don't remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I would put most Americans in that category. Um, I was born in 1945, so I know it principally because I've studied it, and I've studied it a lot. And I studied the development of the atomic bomb and the Soviet attempt to get theirs, and 
it was a very dangerous period because military leaders who really were powerful after World War II, just imagine now, look at Roosevelt at Casablanca, look at Roosevelt in Tehran, look at Roosevelt at Yalta. Cornell Hall was never with him. The people around Roosevelt were the military warriors of World War II. They came out of that war awfully powerful, incredibly powerful. One of them became president, of course, Dwight Eisenhower. We we're very fortunate it was Dwight Eisenhower and not one of the others. A lot of these generals thought they had a new weapon, a new weapon on the battlefield. We had Davy Crockett's in the army. That was just a cannon that fired nuclear weapons. We even had an atomic mine. We were going to plant it in the road and blow up the road and build a big crater so Soviet tanks would fall in it. They thought it was a, it had utility. It took a lot of people studying it, a lot of civilians studying what it meant to, especially once Truman made the decision to go to thermonuclear weapons. We're talking about nuclear weapons that would make the ones that we dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima look like child's play. These are hugely powerful weapons, a thousand times more powerful than those. The megatonnage is just incredible. And a submarine carries a missile that goes towards Moscow, for example, and has 10 of these in its MIRVED warhead. And each has a circular area of probability of about 10 meters. That means it's going to hit right where you wanted it to hit. And the damage is going to be incredible. We now know from study after study, from RAND, from other reputable places, that the nuclear winter that would fall such an exchange would wipe us all out. We wouldn't have to wait for climate change. It, it, it'd wipe us all out. Even a nuclear war in India between India and Pakistan would you know, impact our farming ability for five to 10 years because of the nuclear winter that would occur from it. So we were seized finally of the idiocy, the insanity of thinking about fighting a war with these weapons. And we had lots of people in and out of government who understood that in the think tanks, in the government and so forth. Um, we had an occasion, a very dangerous occasion in the early 50s when the generals were talking about using them when Mao Zedong was moving towards Kuomoe and Matsu, the two islands that he was challenging uh, Chiang Kai-shek's presence on that front Taiwan, as it were. And Eisenhower was in the deliberations and then and general saying, why don't we just nuke China? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have that term at that time. They wanted to use the atomic weapon on China. And it, no, we're not going to do that. Thank God cooler heads prevail. But look at Curtis LeMay. We go on to the Cuban Missile Crisis and John Kennedy. Here's Kennedy getting advice that, thank God, Kennedy had learned from the Bay of Pigs to distrust the Pentagon. He did not trust the Pentagon, nor did Bobby, his brother, the attorney general. And so the two of them discounted a lot of what was coming from the Pentagon, even when it came through McNamara, even when McNamara sort of adulterated a little bit. But Carissa May wanted an invasion on Cuba. We now know from the archives available to us after the Soviet Union collapsed, there were 10 frog missiles with nuclear warheads on them just outside Guantanamo Bay, and the operational control of those missiles had been chopped to the Russian regimental commander, and the purpose of those missiles was to shoot a U.S. invasion fleet with those atomic weapons. <laughs> Guess what would have happened to that invasion fleet? And we probably would have gone into a general nuclear exchange, too, because you got probably 30,000 American dead right there. Um, you're not going to not go back at them. That's these weapons. That's the mental state that goes with these weapons. We tried to tell this to both Islamabad and Delhi, India in 2002, when they were about to have an exchange. Powell went to uh, Islamabad, Rich went to Delhi. We got the president to call them. They were going to exchange. They had no concept of escalation. Uh, what will you do, General Musharraf, if they shoot 20? Well, I'll shoot 20 back. No, you'll probably shoot 40 back and then they'll shoot a hundred and then it'll be Katie bar the door. It'll be over then. And it'll be over for a lot of the world then because you will have had a general nuclear exchange. That's the danger we're in right now, especially with no arms control. And we've destroyed everything. Open skies treaty, INF treaty, ABM treaty. Um, only thing we have left is new start. 
Uh, and I'm afraid that's in jeopardy with this Ukraine crisis because the other member, of course, is Putin. He has about 6,000 more heads and we have about 6,000 more heads. That's enough to annihilate the world 40 times over. Um, and we don't need to be playing with these things. And when people say, like Kagan, oh, you're just, you're just not brave enough. You need to be able to stand up to the tyrant. Okay, let's be smart in what we do in standing up to him and let's don't go nuclear. And to your point about China, I never played a war game and I played 30 or 40 of them, big war games with, for example, Bill Perry sitting in as the president in one with Taiwan that we didn't go nuclear at the end because we attrit the Air Force and Navy of China. They do the same thing to us in the South China Sea and elsewhere. And we're sitting there looking at each other. And some admiral or general says on both sides. And when we play these games, we play with the red side, the Chinese side, played by people who know China well. Both sides are saying, well, we've got to get it. We've lost all this Navy and Air Force asset. We've lost all these people. We've got to do something. So the U.S. side says, well, let's drop a couple of small yield nuclear weapons on Chinese cities like Shanghai. And the Chinese are saying things like, well, why don't we just pop a nuke and we'll do it on the U.S. fleet that's in the South China Sea now? Uh, you don't do that without going further. Now, all the civilian leaders in every war game I participated in, JLAS, uh, the big game we played at Newport Global, all of them say, whoop, stop, we're not going there. They stopped the game there because they realized they're beyond their comprehension of control. That once you go nuclear, you've let the, the genie out of the bottle. And so they usually stop, they, they always stop the game when I was there. And, and you just go to a hot wash up, a review, you know, of what happened during the game. That's what happens when two behemoths, nuclear armed behemoths go at one another conventionally and one of them starts losing. That's what happens. Um, it's a very dangerous place to go. So you don't need to go there. What we need in Ukraine right now is for the US to eat a little crow and to have diplomacy and to push Ukrainians aside if necessary. We're doing it with everything else and have diplomacy and sit down and talk and try to work out a solution that'll stop the killing satisfy as much as possible both sides both sides there's five or six sides here but but you've got to have diplomacy and you've got to talk and you've got to get the killing stop but we don't want to do that we want to use ukraine to bring putin down clear that flank and then go on to china that's what we're doing this for that's the geopolitical strategy go back and read brzezinski that's his geopolitical strategy. That's what we're doing. We're carrying out that strategy. And the people who brought you Iraq in 2003 are the people who are going to bring you that. Well, I guess, you know, that's like going back to that 1992 defense plan and guidance memo of Wolfowitz. Um, that when it came out, you know, saying that we need to have dominate, you know, pearl or world in perpetuity and, and people laughed at it. Um, and thought it was absurd. And now it's the blueprint it's, for Washington. It's with us. So how, how does the absurd get normalized? And I ask you that also with the whole, um, you know, we can win a nuclear idea idea. If you tell yourself a lie long enough, do you believe it? And have the more balanced uh, thinking members of the Pentagon and the State Department been weeded out and have the Kagans, you know, been able to tell this lie long enough that people are actually believing it and acting from it? I think it's a little bit of both. I've been there uh, and I've seen it. I've seen the poison spread. Um, I was asked a question this morning, what did I think about the, I guess it's 19 children and a teacher now, two teachers, whatever, in Texas. Uh, and I said, that I was looking at the Texas news feed at the time, and I was looking at comments just rolling underneath. They were blaming everyone from Biden to Trump to QAnon, you name it. Everything in there was blamed except the right blameworthy person, the American people. It's us, it's me, it's you, it's all of us who have let this happen to us, who have let this happen. 
you know, Malcolm Byrne and John Tierman and uh, Hussein Benai have a book out called The Republic, The Republics of Myth. They nail our myth in the beginning of that book. It's about Iran and the United States and how our myths collide and why we can't negotiate. Or, but they nail our myth. And our myth is now exactly what you were saying. It's contaminating our domestic scene because it's so bad. When you're at war on your periphery as an empire, you bring that home. You bring that war home. You bring that violence home. And we shouldn't be surprised that this is happening to us. We have militarized our law enforcement in this country. We spent $5 billion sending military equipment down to law enforcement, armored cars, heavy weapons, automatic weapons. A SWAT team doing a no-knock drug bus in Houston looks just like a SWAT team in Afghanistan of special operating forces, Navy SEALs, for example. That's what we've done to our society. It's not a Guardia Seville or a Carabinieri like Italy and Spain have, a heavy police force. It's a militarized law enforcement arm. That's what we're doing to ourselves. And so people ask, what's the problem? Why has this happened? It's happened because you've been asleep, Americans. You've been absolutely asleep. Now, if you buy this, if you're for this, if you're for this empire, if you're for this predatory capitalism, if you're for this, even when we do humanitarian actions, we're immoral, like in Libya. If you're for this, I want out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm not with you anymore. But I don't think this republic was founded for this purpose. And I don't think if you've been paying attention and you were really concerned, we'd be doing some of this stuff. It's people who've taken over the government and taken over the reins of power that are truly poisonous, insidious people. As I said to you earlier, I think right now, the person who's standing between, despite his impolitic remarks, these people inside and outside government who want to bring Putin down, use Ukraine, get to China, have a eternal war, is Joe Biden. I don't think he wants that. I, I've, I've known him through Powell and through my own interaction for a long time. I don't think he wants that. I do not think he wants that. So he's a lonely man right now, I imagine despite the appearances maybe of his being a little bit, uh, you know, old, too old, whatever, as the press is want to say from time to time, especially my party, the Republicans, I, I think he understands exactly what's going on. He's been around too long not to. Um, he's standing in between these people who want to do this sort of thing and the rest of the government and I, it's a godsend that he's there. I'm just afraid he's not going to be, a hold, be able to hold out. I, I watched my boss, who I thought was one of the most capable men in the world, Colin Powell. I watched him get overridden by Cheney and ultimately George W. Bush and Condi Rice, who ganged up on him time and time again. And that's what happens. Even if you're the president, that's what happens. Um, you have to depend on your subordinates. And when you can't depend on them, when they're trying to take you down the primrose path, as it were, it's very difficult to stop them. And to your point about nuclear weapons, it's not just Kagan. Go back and look at the hearing in the Congress where the now chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from Idaho, Reich, Senator Reich, makes a statement that the president of the United States should have first use authority with nuclear weapons and should not necessarily have to consult with anyone, including the Congress. This isn't just nuts like Kagan. It's people actually sitting in the Senate of the United States of America. They're imbued with what you just described, this philosophy of us first, us first, us first. If it looks like we're going to be second, we're ready to kill the world. Well, so, I mean, you say that about Biden, but like we, we watched Congress, the entire Congress, not a single dissenting voice, vote this $40 billion. And well, there were a few, there were, there well, were a few voices. Well, not there votes. Were, I mean, well, there, no, I, no, I agree with you. <laughs> well, it's, there, there, there voice were. is fine, but they tried to like minimize the fact that they voted, but um, so, yeah, I want to get to that. So two two ways. One is the the what are the restraints to the war in the past? 
And Chris Hedges spoke to this this week, you know, where there used to be the old liberal wing of the Democratic Party, you know, politicians that would go against the war. We used to have that. And then we used to have an independent media and some of academia and and, you know, even some mainstream journalists that would speak out against war. And um, by the way, uh, Lola, if you could post the action this week to take on the media about driving us to war. And then the third was an organized anti-war movement that included religious leaders. Right. And if you look that that has been effectively annihilated, like concentrated effort from the Pentagon and the State Department to minimize, undermine, uh, you know, vote out, uh, you know, all, uh, you know, there's peace organizations, there's there's not even a foundation that funds peace activism. So there's that restraint is missing. And then right now, you know, we saw um, that um, the piece in NBC and Meet the Press where they were like showing a war game about how we, we could beat China um, that was put on by the CNAS. And then we've got the Council on Foreign Relations. And it's, it's feeling very much like there's the, the military industrial, con uh, and then there's the Council on Foreign Relations and the CNS, and they're operating outside. It's kind of like they're the puppeteers and Congress and the White House are the puppets. And I look at that because I'm trying to find a lever to hold on and, and pull that can scratch it all at the, the momentum of this war machine that's moving forward. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, I think you're, you're on to the point that Malcolm and John and Hussein build in that book in a narrower context, but it, it, it's remarkable how they get our myth. And our myth has become contaminated. I mean, it's been contaminated before. And they point that out when we went to war with Mexico, for example, the most egregious war in our history. Even Ulysses S. Grant said that, and he fought in it. Why am I here? This, this is crazy. And it wasn't an easy war. Grant points out in his memoirs that it was the highest casualty war in our history per capita. We lost more soldiers in Mexico. The Mexicans were not the pushover that people think they were. They fought us tenaciously, and they took a lot of casualties. Um, We've always had these problems. We massacred people in the Philippines and so forth. But now we've institutionalized it. And that's because of this myth. And when we kill people in Texas who are grammar school kids, that's part of the myth. We can't get along anymore without violence. We can't govern ourselves, so we transport that violence overseas. And we try to govern others. What are we trying to do with the NATO European powers right now? We're trying to govern them. We're trying to get Finland in. We're trying, Finland, Sweden, leaving a historic history of neutrality. Big mistake, both countries. They should never have done it, but we managed to get them to do it. And I can just imagine Kagan crowing over it, just crowing over it, because this is what they want. Can't govern yourself, so you go abroad with violence and sanctions. And then you expect the violence and sanctions produced violence not to come to your home. And it comes to your home. So you go abroad further and further. This is what happens to empires. This is how they murder themselves. This is how Lincoln and Adams and Jefferson all predicted we would wind up. Washington even made an explicit statement that nobody quotes today in his farewell address. They talk about, you know, entangling alliances. And Washington said, if you let these political parties, he called them factions, get out of control, they will soon run the country and they will run it in accordance with their ambitious, greedy, selfish interests and not the interest of the country. And it will no longer be a democracy. I mean, what are we doing today? That's exactly what we're doing. And, and people look at me and say, well, Larry, why do you still live here? I say, because the same thing black soldiers used to tell me when I would ask them, why did you fight? We treat you like crap. Why did you fight for us? It's my country too. Okay, it's my country too. And I'd like to see it return to at least a vestige of its former self and stop this worldwide onslaught that it is engineered because it has the money 
and the power and the, and apparently the people to do it. Although, you know what my army is doing now? It's sending recruiters to Mexico. Yes, to recruit people in Mexico because they can't find people enough for the volunteer force. Well, That's what Rome did. That's what Rome did. It couldn't find any citizens to pick up the, the sword. So it went elsewhere to find its soldiers. That's the sign of an empire in decline perhaps even precipitous decline. Well, so um, yeah, uh, we used to have 25% of global GDP. We're down to 16 and- We used to have 50. <laughs> In 1945, we had 51% of the world's GDP. Most of our competitors were prostrate, prostrate at our feet. Yeah. <laughs> Soviet Union, France, England, Germany. They couldn't compete. They were broken. And, and, and enlightened self-interest, you can call it, but we brought them back. And you're right, about 10 years ago, we had 23, 24%, and we just keep on going. And guess what the predominant part of that GDP is? Banking and finance. We are the world's creator of money, taker of money, payer of interest, investment of last resort, and so forth. If we pinpricked ourselves, we'd collapse. Our aggregate debt is going to be 30 trillion within the next decade. Our overall debt against GDP is going to be worse than World War II. It's staggering what we're doing. Well, so, um, you know, besides the insanity of therefore, given what you've said, throwing more money in the incinerator of war. Um, you know, in Ukraine, in, in your conversation with Medea in January, you talked about how the United States was breaking its agreements, its longtime agreements with Russia and how that was contributing to what was happening with Russia and Ukraine. And so now, this last month, we saw the State Department amend the website to wipe out the One China Agreement and preparation to repeat Ukraine on Taiwan. And um, it's not just, you know, further decimating us. Um, first of all, just the respect of the world, because uh, we just continue to warmonger and sanction uh, countries, um, but also the planet that we need to live on uh, for the future. Um, so how, how do we get ahead of this? You know, we, so maybe Biden made a slip so we could get to help warn us what was coming. Um, how do we get away ahead of this when we just watched the uh, tidal wave that engulfed everyone's hearts and minds with Ukraine. There wasn't, you couldn't see through the fog of war and we can feel it like, you know, the, the, <laughs> the waves have moved out and they're ready to come crashing back. What, how, how do we as peace activists get ahead of this or where is the, the sliver of our, where can the sliver of our attention go to help derail it? Well, that's the question I get asked more than any other single question. I'm, I'm going to speak uh, in a synagogue in New York in early June, and I know I've been there, been going there every year for about 10 years or doing it by Zoom the last two years. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of the most intelligent people in New York City are members of this congregation. They ask great questions. I know I'm going to get that question again. Well, what do we do? What do we do? And I've, you know, I've told them everything from Unelect your representatives and your senators. Get new people in there. Uh, do everything you possibly can yourself locally and, and, and statewide and so forth. Uh, it's, it's not a satisfying answer anymore. So what I tell people is, you know, the crisis is coming that is either going to get everyone's attention and collaboration, cooperation, and comity are going to have to be the order of the day, or we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And that's the climate crisis. You know, nuclear weapons could preempt that, of course, but that's the climate crisis. And it is with us right now. In the global south, they're having temperatures for weeks on the end in excess of 125 degrees. You can't live in that kind of climate. Um, we're going to have really dire circumstances in this country eventually, but we're going to be fortunate. North America is going to be one of the latter places to get the full blown effects of it. We are getting incredible effects. Army National Guards, for, for example, now spend seven states worth of Army National Guards now spend more time fighting floods and fires 
than they do anything else. And they are having real problems manning their ranks because of this. Um, Texas has got its guard down on the southern border. When this hits, when climate change in the global south really impacts, which is not going to be that far away, it'll be mid-century maybe, maybe a little earlier, we're going to have the guns sit on, so we're going to have machine guns on the border to keep people out of this country because they're going to have no food, no water, no prospect at all. The young men are going to have Kalashnikovs or M16s, AR15s, whatever. Um, in the simulations we did at CNA, by 2065, we were putting armed men at the border, all manner of people, anybody we could draft into service, and we were shooting people. This is in a simulation we did in 2065 when it really got bad, and you had a billion refugees in the world. Think about that. We got about 178 million refugees in the world today, many of them produced by our wars in Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq, Somalia, Ukraine, Yemen, Yemen, where we're supporting the Saudis. Um, think about a billion, a half a billion to a billion refugees in the world. We can't handle that. You can't set up that many refugee camps. That's coming. That is going to be a moment of such profound crisis that if we don't get our act together, if the world indeed doesn't get its act together, China, Russia, the US, Germany, Brazil, India in particular, we're toast. We can, we can put up the sign and say, hello, dinosaurs, we're going to join you. So I think that crisis is going to be so profound, indeed is shaping up to be that already, that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to cooperate. That's why this you, did you hear what the head of the delegation for the recent uh, IPC panel meeting and releasing its report on 28 February on climate change, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the head of the Russian delegation condemned his country for the invasion of Ukraine and said it's distracting. It's distracting. That's, that's a piece of territory. We're talking about the planet. You get that, Putin? We're talking about the planet. And the head of the Ukrainian delegation uh, said similar remarks about this is crazy. We're fighting over fossil fuels and fossil fuels are killing us. They're killing us. These people are telling the truth. They're not making this up. Uh, and you got people like Kagan and others who are just, oh man, don't talk to me about climate change. They're worse than Donald Trump. It is real and it is powerful. Now, here's a really sad thought. There are people in my political party I could quote Charles Dickens. Remember in that scene in uh, his Ebenezer Scrooge story, Christmas story? Remember when the people are trying to get some money out of Scrooge? And he says, are there no prisons? Are there no poor houses? And they say, well, yes, yes, but they're terrible. And people die there. And he says, well, let them die and decrease the surplus population. Mm -hmm. There are people in my political party and there are people, I think, sitting on the Supreme Court of the United States who subscribe to that philosophy. Let them die and decrease the surplus population. That's frightening. Um, Very. <laughs> well, you know, what do you do when you're, you know, the leadership of your country and too many members of your country have literally gone mad? I mean, we, and we, we've, Earlier this week, uh, talked to Janine J Jackson at FAIR about the propaganda we live in and how distorting it is to our hearts and minds. But, you know, you're talking about people that have basically that aren't, that have become inhuman. And, and so as peace activists, as people who uh, have worked, you know, their, our whole lives for the interconnection, for cooperation, for diplomacy, for the, you know, the health of the planet and the people, you know, you're describing this thing that we're up against. Hmm. Um, you know, it's hard to find as an activist where that lever is, where even to pull, like be able to scratch somebody awake. And so it's, it's there, it, it's there. You know, I was stunned when I was in London I happened to be in London when the war protests against the 2003 invasion of Iraq broke out. And it was unbelievable. It was absolutely unbelievable. The only other time I've ever seen that many people on the street where the bobbies couldn't even, the bobbies were riding horses 
and they couldn't even move. The horses couldn't even move because the people were so thick and pressing in on. The only other place I've ever seen that is New Year's Eve on the Thames <laughs> during the fireworks. You know, when there's 4 million people down there on the Thames. Um, that was colossal. We have to get that kind of spirit going again. We have to take back our democracy. We have to take it back from both sides because both sides are just corrupt. Well, that, thank you so much for that because that's really our message at Code Pink right now. That, um, you know, Congress and the White House, they, they're only, they're being distorted by the fog of war and they need to hear us. And so, you know, now is the time you can join us in the streets in LA for the People's Summit to expose, you know, that militarism and violence that's come from the United States towards Latin America. That's June 8th through 10th. And Lola put that in the chat. And then in DC for, you know, the gathering of the Poor People's Campaign on June 18th. And Yes, Larry, it's the nothing better than standing up, being visible in the middle of madness, showing that there are no lights in the dark tunnel that is militarism and that we need to protect people and planet. And it takes us standing up and speaking out and being as bold and audacious as those who you talk about, who think that there's uh, that you can win a nuclear war or that we can kill people so there's less people on the planet, a, a very disheartening thought. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for speaking out for peace. Um, if you have anything final you want to say to this amazing community that is so engaged and so passionate, um, I, I leave the last words to you. I was on a simulation on Sunday that I've been on for almost 18 months now that posits uh, a different government in Israel. Um, it's a long story, complex story, but we're working with how you would form this third government. There, there would be the Israeli government, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, and then this government. We had a man by the name of Rami Elhanan on there. He belongs to a group that he said in his opening statement, no one, no one wants to get in. It's called the family circle. And it's people who have lost a child to the terrorism, to the IDF, to the Israeli law enforcement, whatever. One was a Palestinian who lost, I think, a 14-year-old daughter. The other was Rami, uh, who lost his daughter in a terrorist attack in Jerusalem in front of his face. Instead of turning hateful, instead of, instead of saying, I want to go kill everybody, they join this group, a group that, as Rami said, no one wants to join, and the criteria for joining is really cruel. The statement he made, the five minutes of statement he made, was so right, so perfect for what we need to do, what we need to make our lives based upon, rather than violence and killing and murder and a tooth for a tooth, that I almost started weeping as he was talking. Um, it was just so powerful. And he's right. He's Mahatma Gandhi. He's Nelson Mandela. He's Desmond Tutu. He's Pope Francis, all wrapped up in one little Israeli lamenting his daughter's death. And he tells it like it is. We need to stop this. Yes. All our voices need to hold that. Thank you. We need to stop this. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for having me. And um, uh, one of the questions was about um, where is the synagogue so other religious leaders might hear you. There's a religious leader on the, on the program. Oh, uh, Temple Emmanuel and Great Neck. Rabbi Bob Whittem, Robert Whittem. Great. Um, so I, we've covered a lot and I promised it would be 40 minutes. So we're beyond um, just deepest gratitude and to all of you onward to peace. And yes, when we ask um, why does there to do, it must stop. And, and that's the, the thing that must continue to come out of our mouths and out of our lives. So thank you, Larry. Thanks, onward Larry. to peace. Good luck. <laughs> thank you.
Vive la Pax. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like oh, we're living in um, Louis the Sixteenth time, the way you describe it. Well, it, you know, I think it was better then. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Frankly, <laughs> I just watched Ken Burns, Benjamin Franklin, and uh, it was it was stunning. Uh, when the French foreign minister Franklin thinks he's going to be unsuccessful, I mean, he's talking to Vergen, the French foreign minister, and Vergen looks at him and says, "How much do you need?" Essentially, and 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 he drains the coffers of France virtually in order to support the American Revolution. Now, of course, French had the French had their own motivations. They didn't like Britain. They wanted, to, you know, but still. I mean, that moment is just so powerful. <laughs> Franklin's even stunned that, that his request is going to be met. Huge sums, too, then. I mean, just huge sums of money. All that work does not need to go in vain. <laughs> well, how do we also, you know, you, you described, you know, we have to get out, you know, we have to kill the madmen. But why are we not seen as madmen in the destruction that we you know, wreck like every day. We we are increasingly being seen that way in the world. The poll, the world polls uh, are showing even our allies have, especially under 40. And if you go under 35 or under 30, it's even worse. Even in South Korea, it's better than 50% think we're the greatest threat to their future. Mm. Um, that's not something we should be fond of. But people mm. like Kagan are. They, they are Chain, Dick Cheney. They think fear, fear is what keeps the world in check. Not respect, not love, not decency, fear. That's the reason they like nuclear weapons. That's the They're ultimate fear. Two very crazy non-humans, unfortunately, yeah. that have a lot of power. Or they're too human in the sense of the lower species. <laughs> They're selfish, they're warmongering, they, but I hate, I hate to say it, they are typical of man's history over the last 5,000 years. Well, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was in a taxi the other day and I was describing to the taxi driver like what was happening and that Biden really wanted you know, to have global hegemony. And, and he looked at me and he goes, doesn't he watch Star Wars? Doesn't he know empires are stupid? <laughs> Good for him. I wish there were more of him out there. <laughs> the rebels will get you eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Star Wars has got faded away. I mean, the, all the lessons are fading and being taken over by a story that gets repeated into people's brains and becomes reality that is so false to the needs of the people in the future. Yeah. And people believe it. You know, George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones is put on by HBO kind of became the stereotypical thing for the generations now. My, I couldn't use Shakespeare in my seminars because my kids did not read Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. When I would quote from King Lear or Hamlet or something like that, it was like speaking to deaf and dumb people. So I started quoting from Game of Thrones. Wow, got their attention. <laughs> but that's a different model. It really is. If you think about it, it's a different model. That's all about power. It's all about murder to keep power. Um, yes, it has its bright spots from time to time, but some of those and the most pronounced one is manufactured. Manufactured out of whole cloth. Dragons, a princess, you know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> those are the most those are the most powerful words in that whole series. You know nothing, Jon Snow. And they come from a wilding from the north, you know. <laughs> Those are powerful words. You know nothing, you human being. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. We have to give that to Emily to make a meme out of that. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, well, you know nothing, right. uh, Robert We all Kagan. know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Surely. Gratitude. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.